A few weeks back, I made a video in which I designed a diode ladder filter from scratch. Being quite happy with the results, I decided to put a bit more work in to polish it up, adding a high and bandpass option, improving the CV range in processing, fixing an annoying bug, and implementing some other quality of life improvements. To top it all off, I then turned my polished circuit into a Eurorack module prototype. Let's see how it sounds. So in this video, I first want to talk about the various changes, additions and fixes before we then dive into the module and its design. In the end, I'll also be doing a giveaway, so stick around if you're feeling lucky. Now the central change to the core circuit is probably the two added filter modes, high pass and band pass. We've talked about high pass filters on this channel before, but band pass filters are kind of uncharted territory. So to start off simple, we'll begin by looking at the high pass option. As we know, the most basic of high pass filters looks like this. The input signal is applied to this side of a capacitor, while the other side, connected to ground through a resistor, provides us with a filtered output. In this kind of setup, both the capacitor and resistor values will determine the filter's cutoff point. But usually, you'd combine a regular fixed value capacitor with a variable resistance to make it freely adjustable. A single stage version like this one will give us a filter slope of 6 dB per octave. And we could get a steeper roll off by chaining multiple stages like this. Notice how all the capacitors have to be in series here, while the resistors are all tied to ground on one end. Okay, so knowing this, how can we modify our original design in order to turn it from a low into a high pass filter? To answer this, let's first recap how and why this ladder structure works as a low pass filter in the first place. So the basic working principle was this. We apply bias voltages to the top and bottom of the ladder that slightly activate the diodes and thereby set their effective resistances, with the bottom being the exact inverse of the top bias voltage. Then we add our input oscillation to both those bias voltages, basically having it right on top of them. The trick here was that we keep the current going through the diode stable by always having the same voltage difference between top and bottom. In effect, this trick allowed us to turn these diodes into voltage controlled resistors, while simultaneously passing our oscillation through them. The only quirk was that unlike with regular resistors, this entire structure is a one-way street, meaning that current can only flow in this direction. So then charging these caps works by pulling in current from the top, while the discharging process sees them push their contents towards the bottom of the ladder. Which is why we need five stages in order to get a three-pole filter, since the top half of our wave is filtered by these, and the bottom half by those three stages. Looking at the basic filter types, our ladder, as it's currently set up, is pretty much equivalent to a passive three-pole low pass, except for these two stages performing double duty here, since they're filtering both halves of our input waveform. Now, if we want to turn this structure into a high pass, we've essentially got two options that should sound vaguely familiar if you've watched my video on resonant high pass filters. The first one is straightforward, but requires a lot of component shuffling. We essentially need to switch the capacitors and resistors positions for every stage, which would give us a proper three-pole passive high pass. The problem with this approach is that it's not easily applicable to our ladder structure though. This has two reasons. 
First of all, our resonance implementation requires us to feed the output signal back into the ladder through the top and bottom capacitors. If these are tied up in the signal path, then that approach won't work anymore, and we'd have to find a way around that. But second, and more importantly, we need to keep a steady current flowing through our diodes in order to set their effective resistances. If we switch their positions with the capacitors, then there won't be a steady stream of current flowing through our ladder anymore, simply because capacitors, by design, block constant currents. And so our diodes will pretty much block as well. So what's the other option? Simple, we ground this point and then apply our input signal to the last filtering capacitor. This way, that capacitor, in conjunction with these resistances to ground, forms something like a simple single-stage high-pass filter. And while this does come with the big downside of essentially bypassing the other two stages, it has the huge advantage of being one-to-one -one applicable to our diode ladder structure, while keeping the resonance feedback path intact. All we have to do is remove the input signal from the bias voltages, and instead apply it to the ladder's middle capacitor. This works because, as we discussed earlier, the diodes provide both a path for the capacitor to be charged and discharged through. In effect, they act kinda like a single resistor to a virtual ground, with the voltage between top and bottom of the ladder controlling its resistance value. And because this is such a minute change to the low-pass configuration, we can implement it quite simply and elegantly. What I've chosen to do is use these basic switches, which are called single pole double throw, or SPDT switches for short. They've got three terminals. The one in the middle is the common connector, and it's flanked by the A and B connectors. The toggle up here can be in one of two positions. In this one, the common connector is wired to the A terminal. And in this one, it's wired to the B terminal. Note how it's a bit counterintuitive, because the active connector is always the one the toggle is pointing away from. Effectively, this lets us hook the common connector up to one of two sources. In our case, those two sources should be the buffered and scaled down input signal or ground. If we then wire the common connector up to our lattice middle capacitor, we can send in our signal to be high pass filtered with the flick of a switch. But what about the existing low pass setup? We said earlier that in order for our high pass to work properly, we need to remove the oscillation from the bias voltages. Thankfully, the same concept works here too. We can use another switch to connect this point, which I'll simply call the low pass input from now on, either to the input signal or to ground. Because if we do ground it, these op amps will simply push out the set CV, or the inverse of that respectively since the logic here was that they add our oscillation to that set CV. And adding zero volts is the same as not changing the CV at all. Great, so we can now alter the filter's mode by flipping one of these two switches on and the other one off. But what happens if we have both of them on at the same time? To find out, let's simply try it on the breadboard. So I've already set the filter up the way we left it last episode. Before we check the low-pass, high-pass combination, let's make sure the pure high-pass version works as expected. For that, I'll simply connect the low-pass input to ground, and then send the signal to the middle filtering capacitor. And as expected, we can now make our input square spikier, and thereby have it sound much more nasal. Resonance seems to work too. But what if I now hook up our low pass input to the oscillation as well? The filter still does something, but I'm not entirely sure if this classifies as any specific filtering type. You can kind of emphasize specific parts of the sound, but it doesn't seem to have much of rhyme or reason to it. Let me know if you know what's going on here. Okay, so the high-pass mode works, and having both inputs active doesn't break the circuit. Let's move on to the bandpass option then. As I mentioned earlier, we haven't touched on this filter type in my videos before, but thankfully it's not all that complicated. While a low-pass filter removes the high end above, 
and a high pass filter removes the low end below the set cutoff point, a band pass does both of those things simultaneously. It will basically only let the frequencies around the cutoff point pass through. Okay, but how do we pull that off? Simple. You first put your input signal through a high pass, and then you feed the output into a low pass stage. Or vice versa. With our three stage setup, we can again implement this without having to shuffle the components around. By grounding the low pass input and applying the oscillation to the second stage's filtering capacitor. This way, this stage will act as the high pass, while the third and final stage will act as the low pass, giving us a bandpass filter in total. And while this will again bypass a stage, it also ensures that we can use that stage for the resonance like before. Now you might notice that both in the high and the bandpass configuration, bypassing stages does not mean disabling them, since our signal is still passing through them. This means that those bypass stages will continue to influence the filtered signal in some capacity. But because this is quite difficult to model, I won't open that kind of worms right now. Frankly, I'm just happy that there is such a simple way to make the high and bandpass modes work, even though they certainly aren't the cleanest or most precise. Okay, so again looking at our ladder structure, it should be quite obvious where we need to apply our signal for the bandpass mode. Since these capacitors are tied up in the resonance feedback path, and this point is the high pass input, our only option really are these two caps. If we send in our oscillation here and here, while also grounding the low and high pass inputs, we've essentially replicated the setup from before. Because remember, these two stages taken together equal the second stage in the basic resistor capacitor chain. Trying this out is, again, thankfully really easy. I'll just ground both the high and low pass inputs, and then send our signal to these two capacitors. And yeah, now we're able to morph the incoming square from a base heavy triangle to a nasal spike. And just for fun, let's check out more filter type combinations. Here's low pass and band pass. And this is high pass and band pass. Okay, so with the different filter modes working, it's now time to look at other improvements I've made to the design. And the most significant is probably the adjusted CV range and processing. There's five changes in total here. First, I've connected the cutoff potentiometer to plus 12 volts and ground, instead of minus 12 volts. Second, I've added another CV input. Third, I've decided to make the input resistance for those CV inputs variable. Then I've raised the resistance to ground here, while also adding a 1K resistor to the clipping diode string. And finally, I've added a diode after the buffering op-amps output. Now, while the first four changes are simply aimed at improving the way we can manipulate the filter's cutoff, the diode here fixes a rather glaring issue. Which is why I'd like to take a look at it in detail first. Now, the version of the filter that I have here on the breadboard doesn't include any of the changes you just saw, yet. So the CV processing is still from the original design. No diode after the op-amp buffer's output. And to reproduce the issue I mentioned, I'll simply have to send a fast envelope into the CV in, while setting the cutoff knob to about 50%. As you can hear, there is this horrible clicking noise whenever the filter transitions from being completely closed to when it's starting to open up. What's up with that? To be honest, I can only speculate here, but I think the issue has something to do with the polarity between these two points. As long as the voltage at the top is above the voltage at the bottom of the ladder, our diodes are in what we call the forward biased mode, which means that there is a current flowing through them in this direction. If we invert that polarity though, the diodes enter the reverse biased mode which means that they'll block the current that's trying to go in this direction now. Which by itself would not be a problem, 
because if these diodes block, our filter is just completely closed. The clicking noise, I think, appears when we force the diodes to switch between reverse biased and forward biased quickly. And we do that whenever our process CV dips below zero volts. Because remember, we're applying that CV as is to the top of the ladder, while sending an inverted copy to the bottom. Thankfully, fixing this problem is that simple. We just place a diode right here. This way, whenever the op-amp's output swings below the zero volts line, that diode will block, and the ladder stays forward biased. Or at least in an unbiased mode. To check if that actually works, let's put in the diode right here. And yeah, the clicking is gone. Perfect. So now we can take a look at the other, less critical changes. The first one is really simple. We connect this side of our cutoff potentiometer to ground instead of minus 12 volts. This is a no-brainer, because the diode here is blocking negative voltages anyway. And so doing this increases our cutoff knob's usable range significantly, since half of that range was mapped to negative voltages before. The next change is closely interlinked with all the remaining adjustments. I wanted to add a second CV input. Doing that is not as easy as it sounds though. If you think back to the original video, you'll remember that we ran into trouble whenever the process CV would rise significantly above 1.2 volts. This was the threshold beyond which our filter would start glitching out. And this meant that we needed to take precautions that would keep our process CV below that threshold. To do that, we added in these diodes to ground that would basically clip our CV. The idea was this. As long as the voltage at this point is below that glitch threshold, the diodes are mostly inactive. But as soon as we try to pass the threshold, they start conducting just enough to prevent the voltage from rising. But of course, this is a gross oversimplification. As we've learned last time, diodes are not digital devices. They don't have clearly defined states, and so they can't precisely clip RCV to a fixed threshold here. Instead, this setup results in something called soft clipping. With soft clipping, you can't instantly stop a voltage from rising. You can only slow that rise down increasingly. So if the incoming voltage is strong enough, it can kind of power through the clipping and push our filter into glitch territory again. That's why it's really important to choose the right values for our resistors here, so that the cutoff knob set to full blast, in combination with a really strong CV input, will still be manageable for our diodes to clip. At the same time, we also don't want to divide the voltage here down too much. Why is that? Well, if we just used really big input resistors and squashed the incoming voltages down super heavily, then we wouldn't be able to make our filter open up at all. Because remember, the cutoff point is directly controlled by the process CV, so a higher CV gives us a higher cutoff frequency. Worse yet, we also need to balance the individual CV sources, meaning potentiometer and external inputs, so that they're all able to raise the cutoff frequency in a generally usable way. Because what good is a cutoff knob that tops out at something around 2 kHz? That's why designing this structure here is like dancing on the edge of a volcano. You want the processed CV to be able to go up as high as possible, but without it crossing the glitch threshold. And by adding another CV input, that dance gets a bit more difficult to coordinate. Because now we have another variable to consider. But it doesn't stop there. The diode we placed after our buffer also has an impact on our processed CV. This is because diodes have what we call a forward voltage drop. In effect, this means that the voltage here will always be lower than the buffer's output voltage. On average, about 3 to 400 millivolts, depending on the current going through the diode. Now, while this might sound like another thing to worry about, it actually plays in our favor. Because with this, we've bought ourselves a little extra headroom for the maximum voltage over here. We can now go significantly beyond the previous threshold without having our filter glitch out. Okay, but how did I figure out which exact resistor values to use here then? Well, as always, I probably could have calculated the values using the appropriate formulas. But as we all know, I'm not that big on maths, which is why I went with an extensive session of trial and error instead. And what I found is that compared to the original design, we can actually get a lot more aggressive with our configuration here, because of the added headroom. 
As you can see, I've increased the value of this resistor going to ground by a lot. 10k versus now 47k. Also, I've dropped the fixed resistances at the CV inputs from 100k down to 47k. But I also decided to add in 100k potentiometers in series here, so that we can adjust the CV intensity on the fly. Finally, let's talk about this 1k resistor. The problem was that without it, the diodes would actually prevent us from pushing the voltage here up as far as we need to. This is because if you drive soft clipping really too far, it basically turns into hard clipping at some point. So I had to handicap the clipping somewhat by setting a minimum resistance for this path to ground. And a 1k seems to be right in the sweet spot here. Okay, enough talking. Time to build this and see if it works as promised. First, I will add in the 1k between the diode string and ground. Next, replace the 10k to ground with a 47k. Then, add in the second CV input with the drop-down resistor and intensity potentiometer. Align the other CV input as well, and reset everything to the low-pass configuration. And we're good to give this a go. Let's check the cutoff knob's range first. I'll turn up the resonance so that the cutoff frequency is emphasized. As you can hear, it goes up reasonably high. Certainly not above 10 kHz, but I still think it's good enough. Next, let's send in two LFOs via the external inputs. And what I'll try to do is set the cutoff knob to full blast and then turn the LFO's volumes way up. Ideally, this won't cause our filter to glitch out. And yeah, that also seems to work okay. With that out of the way, we can look at the two remaining relatively simple adjustments. The first one gives us more flexibility at the filter signal input. In my original design, I've decided to use a fixed value voltage divider here to scale the incoming oscillation down. This was necessary because we wanted to keep our diode ladder from distorting the output signal. The equation here is simple. The lower the signal we feed it, the less distorted the output is going to be. But what if we want to add a touch of distortion? Easy. We add in a potentiometer, set up as a variable voltage divider, that allows us to scale the input signal up or down on the fly. Then we near double the resistor value here, from 330 to 680 ohms. Now if we set the potentiometer to about 12 o'clock, we'll get the same largely undistorted sound we got from the original design. But if we increase the input signal's amplitude from here, we can drive our diode ladder into adding some grit and warmth to the sound. Also, this will change the interaction between signal and resonance, making them gel together more. And speaking of resonance, here's the final adjustment I've made. Instead of using a 10k, 2k, 7 combination for setting the resonance amp's gain, I bump both of those values up by a factor of 10. Now, without these two diodes in the feedback path, doing that wouldn't change anything. And that's because the ratio between these resistances stays the same. So what does this achieve? Simple. We increase the amount of current that will flow through the diodes here. Remember, electricity will always take the path of least resistance. So increasing the value of this resistor will make it more attractive for our current to go through these diodes which in turn will let even more current pass through them, since their effective resistances will drop. Ultimately, doing this will increase the calming, stabilizing effect these diodes have, giving us an even smoother sounding resonance. To try this out, let's take to the breadboard one last time. So first, I'll add in the input scaling potentiometer and switch the 330 ohms resistor for a 680. And then, replace the 10k, 2k, 7 combination here with a 100k, 27k. Let's see how that sounds. Right now, I set the drive pretty low, 
so the resonance is quite dominant in the mix and the sound is really clear. But listen to what happens as I increase the amount of drive. At the very top end, we can hear a little more warmth in the sound, and the resonance is not nearly as prominent. Now, after implementing all these improvements, I decided it's time to get this circuit off the breadboard and into a proper module. Normally, I build all my stuff on stripboard, with handcrafted panels in what's known as the Cosmo format. But this time, I instead wanted to go for something more polished looking. This meant ditching the stripboard in favor of professionally made PCBs, or printed circuit boards, in the popular Eurorack format. The idea with PCBs is that you create a layout for your circuit in a software tool, where you can place components freely and draw copper traces to wire them up. Then you send your design files to a PCB manufacturer to get them produced. This gives you a lot more flexibility and allows for way more efficient and compact layouts than what would be possible on stripboard. And one thing that I particularly like is that you can put your interfacing elements meaning potentiometers, switches and sockets, right on the other side of the PCB. Which saves us a lot of nasty and ugly wiring between panel and circuit board. Speaking of panels, because we can freely choose our PCB size, slap on any graphic we like and have the factory drill holes wherever we want, we can also use the PCB design tool to create some nice looking front plates for our module. Of course, this has some downsides. The PCB material is not as sturdy as aluminum, for example. Also, the print job is not without its flaws. Lines are smudged up or spotty in some places. But overall, I think these are quite usable and presentable, especially considering the manufacturing cost. Now, because I don't want this video to blow past the one hour mark, and also because there already are a bunch of good tutorials out there, I won't explain the PCB design process itself here. If you'd still like to hear me talk about it in a future video, let me know. Okay, time to put one of these bad boys together. Another advantage of using PCB over stripboard is that you can clearly see which type of component goes where. And via the identifiers next to the footprints, you can easily look up the required values. This makes populating the board a breeze. While generally, I found it much easier to solder to these pads than to solder to the copper strips on the strip board, there were some that proved to be extra stubborn and required me to bump up the temperature. These were the pads that connect to the ground plane, and I assume that's because that ground plane conducts a lot of heat. With the chip sockets, power connector and resistors in place, we can now slot in all the diodes. Now for this build, I decided to match them to maximize filter precision. But to be honest, I couldn't tell much of a difference in the end. Finally, we'll add in the capacitors. I would have liked to also match these, but my multimeter sadly does not support that. So instead, I bought caps with a very low tolerance. All done. Push the two TL074s into their sockets and we can start working on the panel. Here the process is straightforward as well. First we mount all the interfacing elements. Then we simply slot panel and board together like a sandwich. Make sure all the pins are properly lined up though. 
now all that's left to do is put some nice looking knob caps on these potentiometers. Plug in a power connector and everything's ready to go. So let's put this into my rack and see if it works. Sounds good to me. Now as you can see, I have quite a few of these, with two still unbuilt. Which is more than I need at the moment, actually. So that's why I will be giving two of these modules away. If you'd like to get one, just post a comment under this video, saying that you're interested. I'll then pick two winners at random and contact them here on YouTube. You can find further information on the giveaway in the description. And that's all I have for this video. If you've enjoyed it, consider supporting me on Patreon. You can get access to a bunch of bonus content there, including a live stream archive, a community Discord server, and, in the near future, also my PCB layouts. I'll leave you with a quick jam session to show off what the filter might sound like in a more musical setting. Until next time, see ya!